Like I said, there's, yeah. there's, it's not just us, our paranoia. When I'm sitting Absolutely. there, we no, have that no. evidence. Yeah. yeah. First time I've been in the center for a long time. <laughs> I don't know. Hey, Bruce, we had a this yeah. German Marshall Fox. Yes, yeah. Hey Tony, stranger, yeah. <laughs> I was in with Walter, I didn't think I could see Walter. 
Yeah, I'm working with him on stuff. We're actually going to put a play on here about the demise of the about presidential wars and give him a defender of liberty. I told Ron Sanders last night the story of all of us coming in for the Boehner meeting of your document. Oh, yeah. He wouldn't hear for that, you know. He said, yeah, I heard about it. I told him the whole story. Walter didn't tell me why I was there, so it was kind of an awakening. Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, we replaced sex with... X, X minus. I think we need to go after the X minus. Yeah, he's, he's even worse than he was saying. Did you talk to the book about the November? I did. Good, good. I'll, I'll coordinate the Hello, institution. This is so talking about. It's just been really nice. I got it. Bruce, I don't think we got to say hello. It's the high. It's the stern. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Justin Talbot Zorn, and I'm the policy director for the uh, National Election Defense Coalition. Thank you all for being here today. If you uh, caught the front page of the New York Times on Sunday, you may have seen that states all across the country, both states led by Republicans and states led by Democrats, are gearing up for what might be the biggest overhaul of election infrastructure of the past 15 years. But if you caught that article, you may have also seen that these state actions are not nearly enough in terms of scale and scope and funding to deal with what is fundamentally a national security threat, the cyber threats to our elections. Thankfully, here on Capitol Hill, both Democrats and Republicans have been increasingly focused on working together on this issue. Both uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and Senator Amy Klobuchar during the NDAA process, and on the House side, Senator Mark Meadows and the House Freedom Caucus and Senator Jim Langevin from the Democratic Caucus coming together to put forward proposals on this. Um, so this issue is time sensitive, it's incredibly serious, but it's also solvable. So today, with this distinguished panel, we're going to be looking at some policy options and some political pathways and strategies for moving forward on this issue. And moderating the panel today is Nicole Austin Hillary, who is counsel to the Brennan Center uh, uh, for Justice, which is based at NYU Law School. And, and she is also the director of the Washington office of the Brennan Center and leads much of their Capitol Hill work. You may have seen much of her work in, in print on a variety of policy issues or may have seen her on TV or heard her on the radio. She's had a distinguished career in law and policy, working at the intersection of civil rights and government accountability, good government, housing policy, and we're honored to have her here moderating the panel. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Good afternoon. Um, I have to say, I love seeing a packed room when I'm on the Hill uh, because I know that in the middle of the day, it's hard to get people here. I know the cookies help, uh, <laughs> but I also know that this is a really important issue for our democracy. So I am encouraged, as I'm sure our, my fellow panelists are, with seeing so many wonderful uh, people in attendance here today. Um, we are going to have a very robust conversation this afternoon, uh, and we are going to make sure that you all in the audience have an opportunity to talk with us as well. Uh, we know, again, that this is an important topic, and we want to not only lay out the issues, we also want to talk about how do we solve these problems that we're faced with. So we're going to be talking about solutions as well. Um, so before we get into that wonderful conversation, I'd like to take an opportunity to introduce our panelists. Um, we really have an esteemed group of experts here with us today, and we're so pleased to have them with us. Um, first, uh, to my immediate right, is Professor J. Alex Halderman. Professor Halderman is a professor of computer science at the University of Michigan and director of Michigan Center for Computer Security and Society. His research focuses on computer security and privacy, with an emphasis on problems that broadly impact society and public policy. Now this fact I love, listen closely. He was recently named by Popular Science as one of the, quote, 
10 Brightest Minds Reshaping Science, Engineering, and the World, end quote. I don't know if anybody can top that. <laughs> he was also part of the team that undertook the first academic security analysis of a direct recording electronic voting machine, finding it was easy to hack and change the outcome uh, of an election. He was part of the lead group of scientists who pushed the Clinton campaign to file for a recount in several states after the election. And he's also testified most recently in front of the Senate Intelligence Committee in June of this year about the threat of election hacking and what can be done about it. Um, so we are so pleased to have Professor Haldeman with us. Uh, next to Professor Haldeman is Bruce Fine. He's the former Associate Deputy Attorney General and a Washington Times columnist. He's also a constitutional and international law expert who focuses his work on national security and intelligence. His current position is heading Bruce Fine and Associates, as well as writing for the Washington Times. He is a former assistant director of the Office of Legal Policy in the Reagan administration, and he is a former FCC general counsel. He also uh, has assisted three dozen countries in constitutional revision and consulted foreign nations on a range of matters that includes elections. Next to Mr. Fine is Shane Scholler, who is county clerk for Greene County, Missouri. He has held that position since 2014. He's also a three-term state representative who stepped down in 2011 to run for Missouri Secretary of State. He uh, was appointed by Senator Roy Blunt in early 2015 to serve as a member of the advisory board of the Federal Election Assistance Commission, uh, and he has spent uh, a great deal of time and will talk to us today about actually what voters have been facing on the ground in dealing with some of these elections issues. Uh, next, we have Susan uh, Greenlaw. Uh, did I pronounce that? Greenhall. Thank you, Susan. Susan Greenhall. Susan Greenhall is with Verified Voting. Uh, she's an election specialist with Verified Voting, uh, where she works on protecting our elections in the era of cyber attacks. She works with cybersecurity experts and advisors on the federal level to help bridge the gap between national cybersecurity policy and, and election administration. She helped CNN in 2006 with its report known collectively as Democracy at Risk, which focused on changing the perception of electronic voting systems by bringing the problems and failures of electronic voting to the mainstream media. And last but not least, we are also joined by Lieutenant Colonel Anthony Tony Schaefer of the London Center for Policy Research, where he serves as Vice President for Operations at the London Center for Policy Research. He was also an intelligence officer and is a recipient of the Bronze Star with 30 years of field and operational experience. He also serves as a senior fellow at the Center for Advanced Defense Studies with courses on psychology of terrorism, leadership and effects-based operations, and he has testified on, occasion, on numerous occasions before Congress on key intelligence issues. And with that, because that's a mouthful, isn't it? This is an amazing panel. With that, uh, we are going to start the conversation. One of the things, though, um, that we wanted to do as we begin our conversation is we thought it was important to help lay the groundwork for what this issue is all about. We all watch the news. We're all smart people. I know we pay attention to, to lots of news agencies and organizations. But we thought it would be helpful to have one of our experts really lay some of the foundational issues out for us today to get us started. Uh, and so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alex Halberman, who is going to show us a brief presentation. And as Alex is coming to the podium, I want to let everyone know that this uh, discussion today is being webcast. So hide your cookies as you're chewing them. Uh, but uh, please be aware of that, uh, as well as when you are asking your questions in the latter part of today's discussion. Alex. Hi, thank you. All right, now if we can get the computer to work. <laughs> All right. There we go. All right, thank you. So I want to just take a few minutes to lay some groundwork. And I'm going to uh, tell you a bit about the cybersecurity landscape for elections. And this is based on my own work over the last 10 years, where as part of my research into cybersecurity issues, I've spent considerable time studying the security of voting machines and voting infrastructure in the US and around the world. So U.S. elections are defined by their massive scale and uh, highly distributed nature. Uh, an election counts 200 million uh, votes from 200 million registered voters uh, across more than 187,000 precincts. 
And to manage this scale and the complexity of the ballots that we use in this country, um, our election system in the U.S. is highly computerized. Um, we use uh, about 52 different models of electronic voting machines to count votes nationwide. And of course, election technology is uh, predominantly the domain of the states. Each state selects its own technology. In some cases, the choices of what technology to use are left up to individual counties and cities. Um, all of this leads to a complex and highly distributed patchwork. But if we simplify it just a little bit, American voting machines fall into two categories. Uh, the first and most widely used system is optical scanners, where a voter votes on a piece of paper that gets scanned in by a computer. Uh, the computer maintains an electronic record and we end up with a ballot box full of papers. Um, the other kind of computer voting machine is called DRE, or Direct Recording Electronic Voting. Uh, in which voters interact with uh, a touch screen or other form of computer to record votes. Where, and the pr primary record of the vote is one in the computer's memory. Sometimes these machines also print out a paper that the voter can see that records the voter's choices. This is called a VVPAT, or Voter Verifiable Paper Audit Trail. So we use these two kinds of machines, but they're both fundamentally inside computers controlled by computer hardware, controlled by reprogrammable software. How secure are they? So about 10 years ago, I was part of the first study where a group of researchers were able to get access to an American voting machine, in this case, the most widely used in the country at the time, the Diebold AccuVote TS touchscreen. And we took it apart and reverse engineered it and played the role of attackers. What can we learn about this machine that will help us carry out a simulated attack? Well, what we found was actually quite disturbing. Uh, we found that we could bypass all of the security features in the machine in some straightforward ways and then tamper with or arbitrarily change all of the electronic records of the vote to make whichever candidate we wanted the winner. In fact, our attack could change the software, could completely reprogram the software inside the voting machine by inserting malicious software into removable memory cards that are used before every election to program the ballot design into the machine. These attacks could also spread from machine to machine uh, in between elections as poll workers use these cards to uh, copy the programming and the election results among the machines. In our demonstration of this attack, uh, we ran an election between George Washington and Benedict Arnold. And of course, everyone votes for George Washington. But on our machine, because we've tampered with the software, Benedict Arnold always wins. So this is just one machine. What about those other 52 different models? Well, many, many different models, both of the optical scan and the DRE variety, have over the past 10 years been examined by uh, official state studies and by research groups. And in every single case where a machine has been rigorously reviewed for cybersecurity, um, it's been shown to suffer from vulnerabilities that would enable vote stealing attacks, every single case. But that's just, <clears throat> excuse me, but that's just individual machines. Let's talk about cyber attacks that might affect elections more broadly. Some attacks that are possible uh, would be highly visible ones, but could still be quite damaging. For instance, attacks that would try to alter the results reported on election night. Um, something like this happened in Ukraine in 2014, where attackers uh, compromised the central election reporting system and reportedly rigged it to uh, present the wrong results. This was detected and stopped at the last minute, um, but it could have severely discredited the entire election. Another category of attacks we might worry about is attempts to sabotage either the voter registration system or the electronic poll books that are used to check in voters on election day. This could um, be an attack directed only at areas likely to vote preferentially for a particular party or candidate and therefore have a partisan effect on the election outcome. Um, both of these attacks, though, would be visible. What about attacks that could undermine results but not be visible, like manipulating the voting machines themselves? So how, how hard would it be to attack the voting machines, which we know have vulnerabilities that let people reprogram them, to change the outcome of even a national election? 
Well, there are three challenges that make that difficult. And uh, the first is that our uh, voting system is diverse and decentralized, which often really is an asset. But it's not insurmountable. Diversity protects us because there's no central point to attack to change results nationwide, but it also hurts us in close elections. Because in a close election, a national outcome might control, might uh, depend on the results of a few swing states or swing districts. An attacker can probe all of these jurisdictions, find the ones that are most weakly protected, and uh, target them. So diversity gives us a diversity of strength and weakness, and we need to bring up the weakest. The second challenge is that the voting machines aren't directly connected to the internet. At least they're not supposed to be. And thank goodness, that's just common sense. But that doesn't mean they're protected from remote attacks. As I mentioned, uh, before every election, the voting machines, every voting machine in the country, needs to be programmed with the design of the ballot, the names of the races and candidates. And uh, this happens by using removable memory cards or USB sticks to copy programming that's created on a central system, an election management system run by the county or an outside company. If that system is infected, um, malware can spread from it to the voting machines across county, whole counties or even multiple counties. So how difficult is it to infect these uh, election management systems? Well, let me give you the example of Michigan, where I come from. 75% of counties in Michigan outsource this pre-election programming to just two small businesses and their 10, 20 person companies. Um, they sell general election supplies, ballot boxes, and I voted stickers in addition to doing pre-election programming, not high security firms. In fact, here's the website of one of them. It even has the pictures and names of all of the employees. If I were going to attack them, I think I'd probably use a phishing attack. That is, I would spoof an email from Sue here, the administrative assistant, uh, to Sue from Larry, the president, saying, uh, oh, I urgently need you to open this file. That could be enough to get malware into their systems, spread to the election management system, and on to the voting machines. So um, there's one more challenge, which is that today 70% of the country has paper records of every vote. And this is fantastic. Uh, this number has actually increased significantly over the past decade. Um, paper is a common sense defense against cyber attacks on elections. It may seem low tech, but in any kind of mission critical high security system, it makes sense to have a physical backup. If you fly on commercial aviation, your plane has a satellite navigation system, but it also by law has a magnetic compass in the cockpit in, in case the computers uh, fail. In elections, paper provides a wonderful kind of backup and complement to the digital records. By checking that the digital records and the paper records agree, we can have high confidence that neither of them has been tampered with. And we don't even have to look at every paper record to do that. Using statistical sampling and what's known as a risk limiting audit, we can just look at a small random number, a random selection of the ballots, basically like taking an exit poll, to make sure that the winner is correct. There's just one problem. Most states don't actually use the paper that they have. Uh, and they don't rigorously audit it to confirm that the winner is correct. So the answer is hacking an election, a national election in the United States, would be easier than we thought, than any of us thought. Uh, attackers could identify close states in advance, scan them off to find the most vulnerable ones, then target the service providers or election management systems that uh, program the voting machines there. By spreading an attack to the machines, they could invisibly change the electronic records corresponding to a fraction of the vote. This would shift the reported outcome, and the only way to detect it would be to look, look at the paper, which most states don't rigorously do today. So the bottom line is that um, although there is no evidence that any past election in the United States has been changed by hacking, um, it's, in my opinion, only a matter of time until one is. And for that reason, the U.S. urgently needs to reform and upgrade its voting infrastructure. There are three things we need to do. We need to make attacks more difficult by applying cybersecurity best practices to election administration. We need to ensure that attacks, if they occur, are detected by implementing 100% paper ballots. 
and there's still a number of states that don't have any physical record of the vote. And we need to make use of that physical evidence when it's recorded by performing audits to a high level of confidence. Manual risk limiting audits are just a common sense kind of quality control, and they can cheaply and effectively uh, give every voter a reason to have confidence in the outcome of every federal race. These reforms could be in place by 2020 if we start now, but the states and federal government need to act. Right, thank you. I think you took your laptop, um, Professor, to ensure that I didn't hack it. <laughs> And there's also a quiz. I didn't tell you. Pull out your papers and pens because that was a lot of information. Uh, thank you so much for that. I'm going to start with uh, the Honorable Shane Scholler um, because as county clerk, um, after hearing all that we just heard from Professor Halderman, I think it's really important to start with what does all of this mean for everyday citizens as they go to the polls, as they engage in our election system? How does all of this impact them? What are you hearing from them? And what kinds of uh, protections uh, and backup systems do you think in your experience we should be talking about? Well, thank you, Nicole. Um, it's extremely important. Um, you know, as I was thinking about this as I was coming out um, on the airplane last night, um, how many of you ever had a file or a program you've been working on like Word and suddenly it mis mysteriously disappeared? Does that happen to anybody? How many of you had your computer attacked by a virus and suddenly everything you had saved is gone? Now, can you imagine that happened on the night of an election? We uh, currently use uh, equipment. We're getting ready to go and purchase new equipment that uh, is uh, based in Microsoft um, Windows back in the 90s, okay? We've had two or three times this last year where we had to delay getting the results out because we were having problems with the system that we were using. And so it's incredibly important in terms to the public that they know that the system we are using is something that can be verified, and so I always say that paper ballots are visible, countable, and audible. But if you have something that's on an electronic system, how are you going to be able to assure a voter if there's an election outcome that is questioned that you absolutely have the results that the voters cast on the day they cast their ballots? You can't. And so that's why I think it's very important that we do that. Secondly, transparency. Transparency is key to the public trust. Our nation was founded upon the idea that we, the people, get the opportunity to be able to choose who our leader is going to be. And so we stand still to the world as a beacon to what freedom is about. And so we have to work to protect that. I believe elections are sacred because they're sacred to the trust of the public in terms of the local government, their state government and their national government. So one of the things that Missouri has, and I had this out front, and if you didn't get a chance to grab it, we have in our code of state regulations, it's a very simple um, system, but it ensures the integrity of the outcome of the election after each election. And that is, first of all, we have bipartisan teams. Everything is posted so the public is invited to it, so that if they want to come see us um, doing it, we actually do what we um, call manual recounts. Sounds almost too simple. Um, right? But we actually will manually recount during any federal election. We'll recount a statewide race that could include a presidential, the presidential race, a Senate race, or any statewide ballot race. We also manually recount a statewide ballot issue. We then come down and we recount um, manually, and it's bipartisan teams that do this, a race for Congress or a race for the state legislature. We then move on down and if you have a judiciary circuit in your county, which we don't any longer because uh, it's decided through a different form, then you also recount that race as well. And then we actually have a county um, race that is recounted. All of this is randomly drawn. The night of the election, we randomly draw the precincts that are going to be um, recounted. We can do no less than 5%. So in Greene County, we have five precincts that are drawn, and those are the polling locations where people vote at. Then the day um, that uh, we actually are doing the post audit testing, so we test all the equipment to make sure it, it performed the way it's supposed to on the day of the election, we then move into the manual recount. And so in that, we are then drawing out of the federal race, the statewide ballot issue, the general assembly or the congressional race, 
and or the county race, they're drawing which race they're going to recount, and then two teams sit down. They always pray they don't get a big precinct when they do it because it takes a long time, and then they go through and they manually recount the results there to make sure that what we released on the night of the election, which is uncertified results, it matches what we released the night of the election. And so last year, and I'll close here quickly, when there were a lot of questions about the integrity of the election, I did everything I could to make sure the media was aware, and we invited them to the pre-testing, the post-testing, and the manual recount. We invited the party chairs. Of course, they're always invited. We invited the public. We wanted to make sure that they would have trust that when they cast that ballot, that how the voters of Green County cast that ballot is exactly what we released and certified when we certify the results. And it brought a great more deal of trust in terms of what we do in Green County. And so I can't add to you how invaluable it is to have that uh, in effect in our state law and what it does to help the public have trust in their elections. Thank you. You know, one of the things I'm hearing uh, as I listen to you talk and as I think about Alex's original presentation is that this sounds like a bifurcated issue. It sounds like it's a national security issue as well as an elections administration issue. So, Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, I'm going to turn to you. Um, is it a bifurcated issue, as I've just explained it? Um, and if so, what is it that we need to do to protect ourselves with respect to, to either of those paradigms? Right. Nicole, thank you for having me. It's great to be here for all, with all of you. And as Nicole said, it's always uh, very rewarding to see a packed house on the Hill for any issue, and this is a very important one. And to your point, yeah, I, I was about to bring up the fact that I, I'm working, this is going to be a, an interesting combination, a conservative working with a progressive. Mm -hmm. Tulsi Gabbard uh, uh, and her staff, uh, I've been meeting with uh, Tulsi, Representative uh, Gabbard and her staff on this issue, and she's actually had planned to do an introduction of a bill on the Paper Act, uh, something parallel what uh, Mark Meadows and company are working. So ironically enough, uh, both sides behind the scenes are actually working this in good faith. Uh, and that's really strange for Capitol Hill. So <laughs> uh, to the point, though, it is both a policy issue relating to the fact that uh, we have to establish conditions for both reliability of the process and confidence in the process. So you're talking about technology and you're talking about psychology. Uh, and so it's very important that we get this right. This is too important to be left to, uh, to random chance, Ho you know, funding something and hoping for the best. You've got to really shepherd this as a, po as a process of everyone chipping in. So why is this a national security issue? Well, I, I uh, have talked about this several times, and Bruce Fine and I work behind the scenes on a lot of interesting things. And so uh, I'm Exhibit A, essentially. I'm one of those guys your mother told you to stay away from when you were a kid. Uh, my job was to penetrate the foreign uh, infrastructure of national of, of countries uh, to do to them what we're talking about trying to do to us in some form. Yes, we do that sort of thing. It's, it's in our national interest. That's why we have spies. So while I can't get into specifics, I can give you generalities and why this is something we have to take uh, and worry about. Uh, uh, Professor Haldeman outlined a number of, of what I would consider vulnerabilities. One of those is malicious software. Uh, malicious software can be introduced any number of ways. Um, Self-replicating, uh, once they're into things, it becomes something you, it's hard to manage. Supply chain operations. People got to buy stuff. You got to update, uh, update it. You got to maintain it. Huge vulnerability. You're never going to fix it completely. And let me give you an illustration of that. Uh, a few years ago, back in the late 90s, I, I ran a unit called Stratus Ivy. It's, this is not classified as my retirement bio on, in the congressional record. One of the things Stratus Afi did was trying to protect uh, the DOD backbone, the communications backbone. And as we were doing what we would call uh, overwatch, trying to protect and detect threats coming in against it, one of the things we noticed is that foreign adversaries were paying great attention to bulletins coming out regarding fixes on the net. Unclassified bulletins saying, hey, by the way, here's a vulnerability. You better go fix it to the admins. Well, inevitably, one or two admins wouldn't fix it. And that vulnerability became an opportunity. So that's exactly what people like I look at regarding the foreign infrastructures. And, and for goodness sake, they're looking at us. So anytime you talk about technology, you're talking about huge vulnerabilities that no matter how smart you are, you got to assume that someone's going to be smarter than the technology. I always tell my son, you got to be smarter than the technology. So we got to do the same thing here. So that's why the idea of a paper trail, something auditable, something real that you can go back and check is hugely important. Uh, and why is that? Well, the other issue is, 
as mentioned, the psychology, the actual belief that the process is fair, that has been recorded and executed properly. Uh, again, I'll give you another metaphor since I can't, I don't want to go into specifics, but uh, one of the things we did years ago as part of a DOD exercise was to compromise a blood supply. Now, how do you compromise a blood supply? It's very much like the challenge here. It's diverse. Blood is kept in a lot of different locations with a lot of different people. It's a, it's a, a commodity. Uh, so how do you get someone to believe that the entire blood supply is bad? Very simple. You contaminate the database which controls the blood supply. You start changing the types of blood. You start changing the number of units of blood so that it becomes unmanageable, that the information you rely upon becomes unusable. Therefore, that supply becomes unusable. That's the other issue here. So again, I'm talking metaphor. I'm not talking about specifics. But the idea here is you have this huge diverse system of all these different states doing different things, all kind of uniformly trying to achieve an objective, but doing it very differently. An adversary smart enough to understand this could target a certain number of states with a certain number of vulnerabilities and upset the entire process. So that's why what we're talking about today is so hugely important, because there are people like me on the other side looking to cause havoc and destroy the confidence in the process. So thank you for having me here today to talk about this. Now that you've frightened us, <laughs> Susan, I'm going to turn to you because I think it's now clear from the lieutenant colonel's comments that this is indeed both a national security issue as well as an elections administration issue, and you are an elections expert. And he's also mentioned that, yeah, you are. <laughs> he's also mentioned that there is um, potential legislation that might help us to deal with this issue. Can you talk to us about exactly what Congress is considering and what the, the variables are that are that are part of the, the types of legislative fixes that they're looking at? Sure. Hi. Um, thank you so much for the question, and thanks, everyone, for coming. And um, I really appreciate that because I want to build on what both Shane and and what Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer were um, speaking about. Um, you know, Alex talked earlier about the necessity of having a paper ballot, as, and as so did everybody else so far, to be able to audit and provide transparency and confidence in the election results. Um, but the, unfortunately, the entire country doesn't have paper ballots. Um, we have a map over there which explains, which sort of shows what different uh, states are using. The green, the um, majority green represents paper ballots, optical scan paper ballots like is used in Greene County, Missouri. Most of the country is using that. The dark green is all vote by mail. The yellow is um, direct record electronic machines, which are electronic machines which spit out a little piece of paper um, behind a piece of glass like a receipt, a thermal piece of paper with a summary of the vote choices on it that the voter has an opportunity to look at that and then it slices off and drops into a ballot box. Um, and that can be used to audit later. It's not optimal because anyone who's looked at a receipt after a couple days knows how hard it is to read it. Um, so if you're trying to recount or do an audit on that, it's, it's going to give you a lot of trouble. And then the red is um, direct record electronic machines that don't have a paper trail. So that, that gives you no hope to audit that or, or recount those machines. You have to trust the digital record. And as we've been told, you can't trust the digital record because it could be compromised and we know people are trying to compromise it. Um, so we're facing a, um, a national security issue, as it's been raised, um, that is administered for, for a national security asset, which is administered on the county level or on the local level, um, and it, which creates a, this um, a bifurcated problem. Um, so the solution that we're seeing being, uh, being pr introduced in Congress um, our, is legislation which would provide um, funding through a program administered by the Election Assistance Commission, asking the Election Assistance Commission to do a study to develop best practices um, on cybersecurity of elections as well as auditing of the election to ensure that the election outcome is correct. Um, uh, Shane described uh, the auditing that they're doing in Greene County very um, uh, thoroughly, but the problem is, is, as Alex told us earlier, most of the country is not doing that type of auditing. In, in this county, they, as, as the county uh, clerk, Shane can say, I know that this result is correct and I can prove it to you. And you don't have to worry that some foreign entity tried to break into the system. Um, most of the country it does not have that type of auditing. There are, um, I want to I want to be clear though, because there's a lot of different types of audits out there. Not all audits, not all post-election audits are created equal. There are um, process audits um, in some states 
which uh, go back and check, did all the poll workers sign in correctly? Did they check the seals on the equipment? Those are important types of audits to make sure that your elections are being administered correctly. But it doesn't tell you that the election outcome was correct and that the voting machines were counting correctly. Only the type of audit where you do the manual count of the paper ballot can tell you that for sure. And this is not just um, our, the position of our advocacy organization or Dr. Halderman. Um, NIST did a study on this in 2011, um, which if anyone wants to see it, I'd be happy to share it with you. Please contact me afterwards. Where they were asked specifically the question, how can we audit electronic equipment to be sure that the election outcome is correct? And the question, the answer that they came up to that question was the only way you can do it is with a paper ballot because we vote by secret ballot, so there's no way for the voter to go back and ensure that their vote was recorded correctly. So you have to have an, a physical artifact because a digital, art, a digital record can be compromised. Um, so uh, going back to the, the legislation that's um, being considered, the Paper Act um, introduced by uh, Congress members Meadows and Langevin um, would provide grants to the states um, that adhere to the best practices that were developed by the Election Assistance Commission um, to upgrade their systems, buy new equipment, get rid of any machines that don't uh, have a, a voter verified paper ballot, and, um, and conduct post-election audits. Um, this is not a mandate. This is a voluntary grant program. This is something that would empower the states to uh, have the resources to protect their systems um, facing the threat that we're facing today, which um, nobody probably envisioned uh, a year or two prior to now. Um, there's precedent for this. We have other parts of our national infrastructure, or critical infrastructure, which is administered at the state and county level, and the federal government provides grants to help support um, the security of those systems. So um, this would not be any uh, federal uh, mandate or requirement or regulation put on the states or the counties, but it would be giving them the resources to secure the systems. Thank you, Susan. Bruce, um, Susan talked about what the legislation would look like. Um, you clearly are someone who's built up a reputation as a, a leading conservative lawyer and thinker, uh, and um, we all know that elections are traditionally run by states and counties. But tell us why, um, despite that tradition of, of how we run elections in this country, why do you think there's a role for Congress to play here? Well, to begin with, uh, it's a national security issue. And even at the outset, uh, the federal government clearly was responsible for deciding who prevailed in a federal election. The Hayes-Tilden dispute in 1876 had Congress actually enact by statute a method to decide the electoral votes that were cast in three states, and then there was a fourth state uh, where there was an issue whether an elector was disqualified. And this electoral commission voted eight to seven, and that's why Rutherford B. Hayes became president. But it was very dicey at the time. Uh, but no one questioned the authority of Congress to decide how you would count votes for the president of the United States, even though they were state-by-state state votes. And probably over 100 years ago, Congress enacted criminal prohibitions on fraud in congressional, senatorial, or presidential elections to safeguard its integrity. Uh, now, there were criminal prohibitions enforced in criminal federal court, so it didn't intrude to that extent on state administration. Uh, and then the Supreme Court in Oregon against Mitchell, this is a decision almost 50 years old, made it clear that uh, congressional power under Article I, Section 4, which says Congress can regulate the times, places, or manners of federal election, uh, gives Congress plenary authority over how federal elections, not state elections, federal elections are operated, including setting eligibility, drafting, you know, writing. They could, they could district themselves if they want, and surely it would include how votes cast for federal officers are counted, recorded, or whatever. So in my judgment, there's no doubt that Congress clearly has the constitutional authority, if it wished, not just to give grants. It could directly prescribe how the votes would be counted, whether it be paper ballots. If the states didn't want to conform to the federal law, then the so-called anti-commandeering rule would require the federal government then to appoint federal officials to take over the, uh, the program. But I think historically states have usually acquiesced in what federal standards have, uh, have uh, provided uh, simply because it 
economizes the, the voting tallies at both the state and the federal level, which routinely occur on the same date and the same time. Now, the reason why I believe that it's almost compulsory that Congress become involved is because uh, the convulsions that could occur in the United States if there was a lack of confidence in the reliability of the outcome of the election are, are quite um, uh, terrifying, if you will. Uh, suppose you had something like uh, the 2000 election, which was quite contentious and gets to the Supreme Court and you're counting uh, hanging chads or whatever, but it wasn't based upon uh, at least the visible effort to try to identify the intent of the voter through an actual card. But it was uh, claims that well, is cyber theft occurred and no one could verify whether it had occurred or not occurred. There weren't paper ballots to confirm one way or the other. You could imagine with the polarization of the United States today, which is uh, much more pronounced than it was even in the year 2000, that if the citizens are still disputing who's running the White House, uh, and the White House basically is the, uh, uh, the fulcrum of our international relations, who has the ability to have the football to press a button if there's a crisis at the time. It could be very, very destabilizing to the country. We see if you look at Kenya today, they just had an election commissioner quit. She uh, thought that you couldn't guarantee the outcome of a re-election there, uh, which was uh, allegedly compromised initially because the balloting was, uh, uh, was deficient and the way it was tallied. It shows you the potential. Now, that doesn't mean it's going to happen every time, but given the, uh, the downside, it's worth taking a few ounces of cure before you have to confront that kind of possibility. And it's really astonishing to me that it's taken so long for Congress to become involved rather than now coming up with a rather constitutionally uh, a very uh, uh, gentle uh, federal effort to ensure the integrity of, of the federal elections. And then there's the last point, and it's probably a little bit different from the, the focus of the discussion we have today, and that is uh, there are two elements involved, it seems to me, in, in cybersecurity. One is developing the protections against uh, corrupting the election, but another is deterring the people who Tony knows is trying to compromise us, which means you have to have a deterrent effect. I mean, it shouldn't be a free ride. You just probe as often as you want to try to uh, uh, disrupt uh, the electoral outcome and nothing ever happens to you because you're in China or Russia and nobody knows how to detect you. Uh, and at least at present, it doesn't seem that we have an international structure, uh, any kind of international covenant agreements that would provide any deterrence from those who would like to wreak havoc in our electoral system. So it's clear to us now that there's, there's a role for the federal government to play. But I want to go back to you, Shane, about the states and what the states can do. Because one, we think it's great, obviously, that Congress is, is going to play a role. But we also know that there are things that states can be doing simultaneously. Um, and we know that some states, such as West Virginia, they recently hired a cybersecurity expert. Colorado and, and Rhode Island adopted risk-limiting audits. What are some of the things that other states are doing or that states should be thinking about doing that can help our elections to be more secure? Well, there are a number of different associations through local election officials. There's the Election Center. There's um, IGO, International Government Officials Organization. Um, of course, I'm part of the Election Assistance Commission Advisory Board. They have a clearinghouse where they share ideas. And then, of course, the Secretary of State's have an organization. Usually, that is where most of those ideas emanate from in terms of solutions. Um, and so, a lot of times, those best practices are shared during that time. <coughs> Excuse me. But I think each state, the issue that I have in terms of, you know, each state doing its own thing is you get away from the uniformity. And that's why I think the solution has to, at some point, you know, think about a measuring stick. If you tried to build a house with a different measure on each measuring stick, what would happen? You'd have a pretty clumsy house at best, right? And so. As an election official, it's important that we be able to choose the election equipment that best fits the needs of our voters. But at the end of the day, when that election is um, verified in terms of the results and the post audit process that occurs, we need the same measuring stick state by state. Because as I look at it in Greene County, when we certify the results, I want to be sure that every other county in a statewide election 
has done the exact same thing we've done or otherwise it's not fair to the voters of Greene County in terms of the ballots they cast because I cannot verify to them in any election in which they participate that the same standard is being used to ensure the outcome is exactly as the voters cast the ballot. So think about that on the national level. The balance of power here in Congress, it's not just about president. It's the majority of Congress that comes into play. And frankly, I think the foreign powers, and probably Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer could say it better than I could, I think sometimes the balance of power of Congress may be more important, frankly, than the president, because this is where things either happen or don't happen in terms of our not only national interest, but foreign interest as well. And so when you think about battleground states and how quickly you often hear from, uh, frankly, the press, well, give us evidence of, you know, um, election tampering or somebody trying to change the outcome. And they'll often give anecdotal results of where somebody tried to commit election fraud. And I'm like, you know, you're probably right. In most instances, if you have one or two persons trying to commit election fraud, it doesn't matter. But if you have a one-vote race, it does matter. We had that happen in 2010 in Kansas City, a race for the state legislature in a primary. The race was decided by one vote. There were two fraudulent votes that were cast. So you begin to think about close elections and when people are watching that, how quickly you can change an outcome. And if you can do it through the electronic tabulation result, if there's no paper ballot to follow, that is a recipe for disaster. And that's why I think we have to have a uniform solution from Congress versus trying to let each state try to figure it out on its own. Susan, I want to give you a chance to add anything to that if you, if you have something. And then I'm going to come back to you, Professor Haldeman, with a really important question. Um, but Susan, um, obviously you just explained to us what's, what the, the, the context is of the federal legislation that we're looking at. Um, do you think that there is also a role for the states to be playing simultaneously? Or is there some way, um, in addition to working with Congress, that the states can all get on the same page? Um, so I think, uh, you, you know, it's a, it's a difficult question because there's states, um, there is a lot of autonomy and the states want to be, um, running the elections themselves. And, and that's an important thing. Nobody wants federalization of the elections. Um, but I think that there could be, um, uh, you know, one thing that we're seeing is this greater sharing of information regarding cyber threats. And, um, you know, one of the, one of my concerns is, we have Alex explaining how these systems could be hacked. And um, I think that, that there may be sometimes some false sense of comfort that my system can't be hacked because it's not connected to the internet. Um, so I think that the, the greater sharing of information regarding the threat to state election officials will definitely help to, um, uh, to, to kind of illustrate what we're up against, that this is, um, you know, it's, it's, it's not fair to have a county uh, uh, um, election office having to defend against the FSB. Um, and this is some place where the federal government can help provide context, information, resources, um, information sharing. Um, the Department of Homeland Security is doing, uh, uh, supposedly expediting the security clearances for state election directors um, and uh, state officials. Um, which I think is is really um, long overdue. However, um, unfortunately, a lot of these elections are not run at the state level. They're run at the county level. There's a few states where the the power is more consolidated at the state level, but it's not. Um, uh, if the state election director is given security clearance and gets the security information from Department of Homeland Security, they can't then share it if the county officials don't have security clearance, right? So I, I don't I know if you have um, some thoughts on on how to address that that um, gap in in security information, um, but I I'm, I think that there is uh, a lot of interest from election officials now to be looking for information that they can um, uh, take into their systems and secure them better, which is important. Um, but I think the bottom line is the best security. Uh, uh, tool that we can use as a paper ballot because it provides resilience into the election process. And the thing that the states need for that is um, funding in most cases. And wherever there are states that have um, paper ballots, the first thing that they said after the 2016 election is we have paper ballots that provides us with resilience in our election. Um, and I know that there's a lot of states that are saying we would be getting paper ballots if we had the funding right now. Um, 
Susan, uh, you mentioned two things using their acronyms, and I know I'm this sorry. is Washington and we all use acronyms. My family gets tired of me using acronyms. They're like, we can't understand you. Um, mm. But tell us, you mentioned the NIST report and you mentioned FSB. Could you just remind people what those acronyms stand sure. for? Sure. Actually, I don't know what FSB stands for. Um, it's Russian. It's the Russian <laughs> intelligence. Um, Cozy Bear and Fancy Bear, um, <laughs> APT 20 and 29. Um, I'll defer to Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer. It's their federal intelligence system. It's it, but it must, say f it must be something in Russian, right? FSB. I don't speak Russian. Yeah, <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so FSB is, is the, the Russian intelligence, and NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, um, the federal agency that has uh, that sets standards for everything from rulers to cybersecurity, um, and they also work on setting uh, voluntary voting system guidelines and they did the study that I mentioned about auditing elections um, which said the only way you can do it to know whether the election outcome is correct or not is with a paper ballot. Okay, thank you. And Susan, you prefaced the question that I am now going to pose to Professor Halderman which is this. We've heard about auditing, we've heard about backup systems. The question, this is Washington, this is Capitol Hill, the question that everyone has is how much does all this cost? And where do we get the money for this? All right. Well, that's that's a great question, and there really are um, uh, there. This really is if you're thinking about the cost of national security or even of cybersecurity. This is one of the most economical to address and solvable problems that we have. Um, so just let's let's get to the numbers. So the uh, best estimates that. Uh, I've seen so far on the cost of upgrading the voting machines, uh, the ones that are in red or yellow on the map there. Um, uh, comes from the Brennan Center, and the Brennan Center estimate is that the cost of uh, upgrading the paperless voting systems nationwide would be uh, approximately 100 to 400 million dollars. This is a cost that could be shared between the federal government and the states. The states, of course, eventually need to replace, replace that aging infrastructure on their own. Um, so there are, are ways to reduce that uh, federal share of that number. But these upgrades aren't enough, of course. Once you have paper records, you also need to audit it, or you might as well not have that paper in the first place. So making use of that paper by implementing audits is the second component of the, of the solution. Um, a, the cost of audits for all federal races nationwide um, according to my estimates, would be less than $25 million a year to give us high confidence in every federal race. Um, that number would also go down over time as older voting systems were replaced with new ones that made auditing even more economical to perform. Once again, this is a number that could be shared between the, uh, the federal government and the states. Many states already have some form of audit, so you're not uh, starting at a cost of zero. Uh, 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 you're not starting with uh, zero to get up to that uh, $25 million estimate. So um, we're talking about small numbers in the context of national security. Um, and in the context of cybersecurity, there are so many problems where an effective solution is going to require either incredible federal investment or breakthroughs in science and technology to have an effective solution. Voting is a place where simple, low-tech um, approaches, paper looking at that paper, uh, can give us a, a really high level of defense. And I, I think that's why this is an opportunity for the federal government to work with the states, empower the states to protect themselves, and um, rise to the occasion and solve a prime cyber challenge facing our country. Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer, um, you know, you said uh, from the outset you're conservative, um, and, and now we're talking about dollars uh, and cents. Um, and, um, you know, one of the things we should talk about, and I'd love to hear your comments on this, is, you know, given the level of attacks that we now understand and we've been subject, subjected to. Um, does that change your calculus at all about the role that the federal government should be playing in solving this problem? No, I, th I think um, uh, Mark Meadows, Congressman Meadows, and the Liberty Caucus, Freedom Caucus, uh, Bruce Fine and I work very closely with them on a number of issues. Um, I think recognize the importance of both defending the Tenth Amendment of the idea of states having their own uh, 
dominance, if you, if, 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 to lack of a better term, of, of the process. Uh, Bruce pointed out the legality of the, the history of this issue. So I think no, no one wants to interfere with that legality or the constitutional um, protections of allowing the states to run their own show. With that said, uh, I think the one thing the federal government could do in this case is, you know, actually say this is a best this is the best practices principles that we have seen. We'd like you to think about adapting it. Here's, you know, some money to do it. And again, we're not talking about, uh, you know, an F-35 here, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, we could cash one of those in and fund like, you know, a dozen different things. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, frankly, speaking as a budget hawk and a defense hawk both, uh, I think we could uh, easily find uh, a path to finding the money that uh, the professor's talking about here. Okay, great. Um, Bruce, I'm going to give my, my last question to you, and then we're going to open it up to the audience. Um, you are a journalist. Uh, one of the difficulties of these kinds of issues is, you know, getting the American public to understand and relate to what these problems are. People are getting lots of things tossed at them every day in the news. They're hearing all these different stories about cyber attacks and about audits and about what states should be doing versus what the federal government should be doing. What, what role does the media have? Um, what's your, what do you see as your role as a member of the media in helping to explain these issues and, and get the citizenry engaged on these issues? Well, the, the purpose of freedom of the press protected by the First Amendment was what uh, Justice Potter Stewart called organized scrutiny of government. Uh, the purpose of the press is to inform and to provide a foundation for the public in their own minds to make up their decisions as to what Congress ought to do. And uh, that means they have to do their homework, means they have to, uh, uh, irrespective of New York Times versus Sullivan, uh, not be satisfied with just not knowingly publish uh, factual falsehoods. Uh, and uh, not necessarily uh, trying to be first on the beat, but waiting um, until you know your facts before you publish. It, but it's largely, a, you know, it should be a transmission belt. They can only report, you know, what Congress is in fact doing. And they don't want to exaggerate, you know, the, uh, the danger of compromising the electoral system, but they don't want to understate it as well. Because the media in some sense is like the people who count the ballots. Uh, they're influence depends upon the confidence of their readership that they're getting the truth and it's accurate. Uh, and I think that's uh, shaken oftentimes uh, because the, the norms in the media. I, I just want to make just one observation to sort of build on what Tony said. You no, know, the money involved here on this national security issue, you couldn't even find it at a decimal point in the Defense Department's mm -hmm. budget. They spend like $400 million a year on bands playing music, uh, which are far less critical to our national security than getting the election. And bad music at that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, it's one said that uh, military justice is to justice what military music is to Beethoven. <laughs> that is a wonderful segue to our audience, Bruce. Um, if you have a question, please raise your hand and tell us who you are and what your affiliation is. And if you are directing your question to a specific panelist, please let us know that. So I'll start here and then go here. Yes. Um, I don't think we have microphones. Um, no, we do not have microphones. But if you can stand and project, um, I think we'll all be able to hear you. Yeah, my name is Chris. Uh, I work uh, for Senator Weidman and staff over there. So uh, the question is for Mr. Scholler and uh, Dr. Holloman. Um, Mr. Scholler, you have described the uh, audit system that you have in your state, yes. where you pick a precinct at random and then have this sort of bipartisan team go in. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like if the precinct that you pick is not the one that's been hacked, then you won't be able to protect uh, an incident. And I know that two of the states that have passed uh, risk limiting audits sort of actually test ballots across the precinct, so that way they don't have to <coughs> hope that the precinct that they test is the one where uh, the bad things have happened. So what I'd like to hear is, like, do you think that your auditing procedures are sufficient against sort of sophisticated adversaries? And then, Dr. Halderman, do you believe that the Missouri system is sufficient, or would you encourage them to go down the risk limiting audit model? Thank you. First of all, that's the minimum standard. You're not limited to 5%. Um, that's also why you do across the board in terms of the races that you choose in the precincts so that you're not being led towards one particular recount. And so um, the thing you have to remember, remember I was going to mention this, is that you have to remember 
election officials across the country normally don't have huge budgets and they don't have huge resources okay I'm talking about county by county especially you're from Wyoming um, is that correct so Oregon. Oregon I'm sorry Oregon so um, when you look at that you have to be careful in terms of like for example in in Missouri the county clerk has a number of administrative duties just beyond um, holding elections that's one of their administrative duties and so um, you have to have a standard there that can certainly fit the needs across the spectrum of you know you go to the bigger jurisdictions they have the resources to be able to probably do a full post audit in terms of if they wanted to manually recount every result the only thing you have to keep in consideration is that normally you have a certification period that you have to send the Secretary of State that is two weeks for example in Missouri so to try to pull a full recount for every single um, election that was on the ballot that night would almost go against the very purpose of the reason we put convenience in elections with technology um, so certainly if there's any suspicion that something you know did air in terms of the election result that's why the election official has the authority to recount as many of the precincts as the election authority sees necessary um, and also if the race is less than one half of one percent in terms of the outcome between the top two vote getters that is automatically recounted as well and so that's another part of the CSR that's included too so so election auditing is uh, a statistical problem it's very much like taking a poll and one of the things that you need to account for in auditing an election is the margin of victory because if the election is a landslide you don't have to actually look at that many ballots to confirm that it really was a landslide but if it was decided by one vote then obviously you have to look at almost all of the ballots in order to confirm that that's actually the correct result um, so really whether a particular um, number of precincts or, or what have you is adequate that's something that you need to um, where you need to do the statistics for that particular election to see. But the um, latest ideas in post-election auditing that a couple of states, New Mexico and Colorado, and I think Rhode Island now just moving towards, um, determine the amount of auditing work that's going to be done uh, based on the margin of victory and other factors by actually doing that statistical calculation. All of this is just a kind of trade-off between trying to do as little work as you need to in order to get high confidence that an attack would be de detected and corrected. And we're trying to do that in the most economical way possible by using statistical methods to reduce the work you'd have to do from recounting everything by hand to just looking at a sample of the ballots. Did anyone else have anything to add to that question? Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. And then I'll go to you in the back. Thank you. Uh, my name is Rick Weber. I work for Inside Cybersecurity. So I get, my question, I guess, is mostly directed to Susan and Alex. A lot of talk about cybersecurity <coughs> best practices. Can you lay out for us exactly what those best practices are? And then maybe across the entire panel on the paper, on the paper act, what does everybody think of the bill? Yes or no? Is it a good idea or not? All right, sure. So the kinds of best practices that we're talking about at a high level are really uh, not anything that's particularly new, at least to not new to government, not new to industry. These are things that we, uh, we do all the time in cybersecurity. So things like making sure that you're doing penetration testing and threat uh, assessments. Uh, things like uh, ensuring that the uh, workers involved in elections have adequate security training. Uh, when you think about where the front lines of this problem are, they're really the, the state and even the local election offices and county election workers. Maybe there's not even a single employee in the county government who actually has security expertise sufficient to be doing that uh, training and protection right now. So making sure that we get those, um, those standard but um, uh, not universal in local government administration practices to happen uh, is is critically important and then there are the uh, the servers that states maintain for things like voter registration which um, in uh, in many cases have not been adequately assessed for security and making sure that they're appropriately locked down too so that's at a high level I think the details of that uh, of those best practices are something that um, 
uh, we hope, uh, I hope, would be fleshed out by um, uh, in in consultation with the states by uh, by cy uh, by an agency with cybersecurity expertise. Um, uh, I I would add to that. I think um, uh, you know one of the important uh, uh, things to keep in mind is that because the the elections are administered at the county level in so many different states that there's um, you know different different practices, different levels, and um, having greater information about um, the cybersecurity best practices, good password um, protocols, uh, et cetera, those type of things um, being disseminated to hopefully most of the election offices are already um, using these, but to reinforce it and make sure that everybody, and when new people come in, when people transition out, that those best practices um, remain intact and are, are continuing to be used. Um, and also, uh, as Alex had mentioned, you know, there's always the problem of the vendors, too. So um, the best practices need to be extended to, hopefully, to the way the vendors are operating their systems. Um, as Lieutenant Colonel Schaefer said that, you know, there's the one person that doesn't go and, and update their system or doesn't, um, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> that, Oh, the strongest, yeah, becomes your weakest link. Um, so uh, uh, more information that could ensure that, that those best practices are, are reinforced uniformly across the country would be really beneficial. Uh, um, I, there's discussion right now of trying to apply the NIST framework um, to uh, election systems um, with the EAC, between EAC, DHS, and NIST. There, I... I I don't know how far along that process is, but I know that that idea has been discussed. Yes. Oh. Yes, Shane, please. I think the other thing that we've been talking about ballots, and it was mentioned in, in Alex's presentation at the very beginning, and that is many election authorities are going to electronic poll books. And clearly there's been attempts to get into the voter registration systems, and last year's election authority, I thought, are they trying to get access to, because we have a central voter registration system through our Secretary of State, are they trying to get access to signatures and people's voting patterns in terms of which elections they vote in or don't, and be able to cast absentee ballots? I think actually it got too complicated. If you can create chaos on the day of an election when a voter shows up, and that's finally dawned on me earlier this year what they were trying to do, you've already compromised the um, confidence that any voter is going to have in terms of the election being conducted when they can't get in to vote. And so we have to remember the front end is just as critical as the back end, and we can't leave that out of the conversation. Well, if I, I could just add, that's absolutely right. We need to make it as hard as possible to attack the system in any way that's going to give the impression that uh, our elections are uh, not being conducted with integrity. And then we have to actually make it so that it's very, very difficult to undetectably change the result of the elections. And that's where these two components uh, come together. The best practices is, is to harden the system against attack, and having paper and auditing is what gives us a guarantee that any attack that did succeed, despite those measures, would be detected and corrected. And one of the things that went add to that is that, um, as I mentioned earlier, you have different offices of different sizes. Uh, and for example, we're fortunate we have an information systems office that's part of the county. And so last year during the election, I was visiting to them. And then I was also um, doing everything I could to make sure that what we had was secure. But at the end of the day, I knew that their access was limited as well, even as a county in terms of what we do. And we implemented the best practices that they recommend in our office. but. Think of the smaller counties where I've mentioned they are juggling a number of administrative duties. And so oftentimes the level of sophistication because the resources of the county is not there to be able to provide for them to be able to protect their system as a county. Um, and we had one county, Camden County, Missouri, where their entire system was compromised. I believe it was late last year or earlier this year. And they had to completely go off the grid during the November election and the county clerk was working outside of it because our whole system had been compromised as a county. And so that's one thing when you're talking about trying to protect everyone. That's why my goal is I know there's issues between the Department of Homeland Security and our Secretary of State in terms of information sharing because I visit with our Secretary of State about it. 
And as I recommended him, I said, I understand there's issues, but we've got to figure out how to work together so that everyone has confidence when they go out on election day that their system can't be compromised, especially when it comes to voter registration information. Great. There's a question here in the back, and then I'll get you next. Would be uh, capturing the the culprits and <coughs> either arrange with extradition agreements or otherwise mm -hmm. to punish them. Now that can be hard, and I think that Tony points out we do the same thing that they're trying to do to us. Perhaps it's less important because so many countries abroad. What does it matter? You tamper with the Russian or the Chinese system; they don't have any votes anyway that really count. So it's it, it doesn't really help us so much with regard to well, if you do it to us, we'll we'll fight back. On the other hand, it is possible to think about negotiating some international covenant or treaty that uh, would provide that there will be a general uh, refraining from uh, uh, trying to interfere with a democratic dispensation in countries uh, by tampering with voting. Now, whether that will work, I don't know. The, the biggest advantage that we have over other countries, we've got a lot of leverage that we can utilize to penalize countries that we identify as being sources of interference with our elections, cutting off economic aid, military aid, visas, or that kind of thing, uh, like we do with regard to human rights violations under the uh, Global Magnitsky Human Rights Accountability Act, and that would provide a deterrence. This is a, a substrat of the larger cyber unit, uh, issues going on right now. The issue of deterrence within cyber, the cyber warfare space is something completely unresolved. I mean, I was called into the Federal Reserve back in uh, 2011 and briefed on the fact that the Chinese had just uh, essentially gone through the uh, Chicago Mercantile uh, in cyberspace and completely left untouched. And I, I asked them, you know, would you allow uh, People's Liberation soldiers to kind of walk into the Mercantile, just kind of walk around and shuffle through people's desks? And they said, well, of course not, but you let them do it in cyberspace. So this is not a small issue, and this is but one aspect of the larger issue of what are the pr appropriate strategies and responses. The best thing I could say is within the Paper Act, uh, when you do establish principles and, and, and best practices, that is a, an inoculation. That's the beginning. Uh, regarding this other stuff that Bruce brought up, this needs to be something that's tied to uh, the foreign affairs issues, the defense issues, and the intelligence issues as part of legislation. Uh, this needs to be uh, essentially a part of the larger dialogue on the issues of negotiations, of treaties, of all these other things. And I'd like to say that, say, believe that uh, maybe some addendum of the Paper Act or something that Tulsi Gabbard's working on can stipulate as part of this implementation of the policy that we do an end-to-end -end study of what the threat is, assess the threat. I mean, look, uh, one of the things I do all the time for a number of, uh, of senior uh, leaders is we do what we call red teaming. We actually examine the threat and put ourselves in the, the shoes of the adversary. And the idea should be let's put together a, a, a team that can do this. Let's look at the vulnerabilities so that we, we go into the next set of elections, both, uh, uh, you know, midterms and, and presidential, uh, with our eyes wide open of what was is within the realm of the doability. Uh, John Lehman, a friend of mine who was on the 9-11 Commission, said that one of the things that we suffer from is lack of imagination. Well, I, don't, I, I disagree with him. I said, no, it's not lack of imagination. It's lack of bu bureaucrats with political will to allow us to think through these things. So that's something we should definitely work on. <clears throat> so um, the, oh, I'm sorry, please, go ahead. All right. The best way to deter an attack is to convince the attacker that the attack is going to fail. And there are two things that an attack on our election system might try to do. It might try to change who wins, or it might try to uh, give uh, to destroy voters' confidence in the system. If we change our voting system to make sure that every vote is recorded on paper and that paper is rigorously audited, neither of those attacks is going to work because all voters are going to have ample basis for confidence that the outcome is correct, and an attack, if one occurred, would have been discovered and corrected. Okay. I see several hands up now, but before I do that, Justin, I need somebody to give me a time check because I'll keep us here talking all, talking all afternoon because it's important. Twelve minutes? Okay. 
talk fast. Um, okay, I'm going to start with you and then go to you, sir, and then, no, actually, I believe in gender equity. I'm going to go to you and then one of the ladies over here and then back to you then back to the lady in the back. Remember your spaces. Okay. <laughs> go ahead, please. Okay, so um, I'm Jack from uh, Office of Congressman Raskin. Um, so say you do an audit and it comes back with some discrepancies between the electronic <laughs> ballots and the paper ballots. Which one do you trust? Because, I mean, the paper ballots, they can also be tampered with. There can, there's, there's ways that people could can tamper with that or miscount. How do you go about solving that problem? Also, if it takes a long time to, to do a full audit, how does that affect the public's confidence in the election process? Um, the standard says that if there's a discrepancy of, of over one half of one percent, then that's when we have to take a look at the system to see if there's any issue in terms of how it's being recorded. But the paper ballot is always going to be the standard by which you measure, absolutely. And yes, there are instances where people have tried to change outcomes through um, fraudulent manipulation of, of paper ballots, um, but we certainly want to go to a standard that we can look at and visibly see. And then at that point, if there's any um, evidence of fraud, that's when you bring in the authorities. And normally you're going to go to the judiciary um, and present the evidence at that point. And so there's going to be, um, it's not going to be an isolated situation in terms of the authority making that decision on their own. You're going to bring in a number of people um, at that point to work on the issue at hand. Um, so. But it is amazing, um, you know, when we've, we had a couple races for my very first election where we had the less than one half of 1% in terms of the outcome, and we went through and counted the paper ballots, and it was exactly as the machine had told us in terms of what the outcome was. And so then in Missouri, in that case, actually it was two ties, I apologize, they had two races with the two ties. So you can either flip a coin in Missouri if you want to put yourself in that situation as a candidate to see who wins, or you can have another election. In one of the jurisdictions, they decided to flip a coin, and the other one we had a new election for that particular instance where it was a, a tie. So there's, each state will have its own system, but certainly if there's any evidence of fraud, that's when the authorities are going to be brought in. One thing you need to think about, too, in terms of a vulnerability uh, it's much less likely somebody will try to tamper with you know, a single paper ballot. You can't do it in mass numbers without risking detection. So is somebody really going to try to tamper with one paper ballot when the likelihood of effect an election is so tiny compared to going into an electoral system and being able to change a very large number? There at least you have, you know, your wrongdoing at least might return you something politically advantageous as opposed to uh, the tiny mischief you can do it one on one at a paper level. I, I just like to add that in so the type of um, audit that they're doing in Missouri where um, there's a set amount the pre precincts are selected by random and then if there's a problem the official has the discretion to uh, escalate the uh, the manual count. Um, but the audits that Alex had mentioned earlier the risk limiting audits which are a, sort of a, a more cutting edge statistical um, protocol for auditing elections um, uh, looks at pulling certain ballots and if you see discrepancies then it causes an escalation and you pull more ballots um, to ensure that either you have confidence that the election would not be overturned by a full hand count or that um, you need to go to a full hand count. So um, there, that's sort of, I guess it's a sliding scale is the easiest, simplest way to put it, but um, that's, that's a different sort of audit technology that's, that's being um, uh, implemented now in, in those states that Alex had mentioned, Colorado, Rhode Island, and um, New Mexico. So for the remaining questions, I'm going to ask you to do this. I'm going to ask you to, after you tell us who you are and give us your question, can you direct it to one of the panelists? Because I want to make sure we get in all the remaining questions. And I, I hear the clock, the proverbial clock ticking. So please. Here and in Europe. Could anyone speak to that and any recommendations you have for solving that side of 
I, I think that's a wonderful <laughs> topic for another panel. Um, <laughs> but it's really an enormous issue. And they, they go hand in hand in that they, uh, the vulnerabilities of the election system can also be used to undermine confidence. Um, and uh, are also things that might be exploited uh, through, uh, through remote attacks by, by foreign powers. But uh, I think they are, um, they are separable issues. Yeah, we need to separate this. I, I would welcome another panel on this, but the, the honest answer is the Russians have been up to this sort of no good for decades. Uh, every nation in the world has engaged in what I call information operations. And so the idea of, of perception management goes back, uh, we had extensive co programs during the Cold War and something called reflexive control. Certain responses can be predicted based on deep analysis of a given system. So, but that's, that's something way beyond what we're talking about here today. And there's the First Amendment protecting freedom of speech as well. So uh, that comes into play no matter who the source of the speech is. We've noted this idea for another panel, so stay tuned. Uh, yes, sir. that uh, service these voting machines. Um, and obviously there's a broader interest just in some banking and other sectors that are private but have large public implications. Just wondering if, if you or Bruce or anyone else in the panel could touch upon some of the measures that the private sector should be taking to protect themselves <coughs> from hacking since that's a new entry point that uh, state actors are using to get to the government uh, and government functions. Um, Again, a very broad question, but there's a lot of low-hanging fruit for the private sector, too. Things like making sure that people um, are using multi-factor authentication. Uh, things like making sure that systems are being scanned for vulnerabilities on a regular basis. Um, these are, are abundant, there are abundant simple steps that people can take that make uh, them harder to target and harder to exploit. Uh, we're never going to be able to guarantee that no one will be able to break into a particular system. Um, but like voting uh, in the private sector, there are many cases where we can at least try to make sure that we'll find out if uh, someone succeeds at doing that. Bruce? I'd just say that the problem in the private sector and somewhat in the government sector too is what you might call fifth columnists, people who are working on it who actually uh, betray uh, the secrets that they possess and we read about it oftentimes in the newspapers. Uh, so there has to be uh, you know, a more rigorous screening of who actually uh, is given access to this sensitive information if we want to prevent uh, large-scale disruption that you've described. Okay. Um, I'd like to add, I think, I think that's a really important point. I, I, I'm, um, hope, I'm hopeful that people are gonna put um, more of a focus on that, and I wanted to just highlight that Senator Wyden sent a number of uh, sent letters, a number of questions to all of the vendors, the major vendors of voting system equipment, asking uh, uh, about their security practices. And I, uh, one thing that I think um, people may want to consider is also uh, a requirement for vendors to um, disclose if they have any sort of security breach. Um, which voting system vendors are not required to disclose that information to the states or the counties that um, use them or to the Election Assistance Commission. And that's something that as an election official I'm doing is I'm putting together a letter and been working with our information system teams who protects our county information. We had a letter that was sent out through one of the organizations it belonged to and I sent it to him. I said, does this really cover it? And he said, actually, there's a lot of gaps there for companies to be able to just gloss over. And so he's went in and helped me get a lot more detail and information we're asking. So I'll be sending that shortly to all of our vendors as well as our Secretary of State because I want to hear what they're doing to protect the voter registration system information. So part of it is you, at least from my viewpoint of it as an election official, you have to be conscientious and aware and do everything you can, you know. So I'm going to do what I can on my end. And again, hopefully everyone on the other end is doing what they can as well. And then we have our last question in the back.
So um, the uh, esteemed uh, state election director of Virginia is actually in the back of the room. Um, and uh, so I'm calling him out. Um, so um, unfortunately, I tried to get, um, we, ha we, we have another image of the map, which is up to date now, um, which would have Virginia moving to all green. Um, but with technology problems this morning, I was unable to get it. So we, we have this is as of to, this is as of November 2016. This is not actually up to date of today. So for, we could take a sharpie and fill in Virginia. I should do the um, same, yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, so the states that are um, you can see from the map the states that that are all red are all DRE states. Um, the other states that um, that have DREs largely you know, Pennsylvania. Indiana, Tennessee, Texas, um, uh, where, where I, I, I always forget a couple. Um, but the, the um, so those are the states that uh, are, um, are, you know, still are, need to be moving to paper. Um, Georgia, um, Georgia is, a, a, is going to be um, a, an interesting case to see whether or not they will be willing, willing to move to paper. The Secretary of State is talking now about it, although they're trialing a system which um, would, uh, doesn't, it, it isn't an optical scan paper ballot. It, it's a touchscreen machine that produces a paper ballot and then it gets scanned. Um, that is not optimal uh, because now you need to have an expensive digital touchscreen machine to produce a paper ballot for each voter that comes into the polling place to vote. Um, it's much more efficient and, um, and cost effective to have one scanning system and give people a paper ballot and a pencil or pen and have them, and Shane will tell you, to have them fill it in and then you can have a table like this with a bunch of cardboard places set up for a lot of voters to come in and, and uh, your lines are going to move a lot quicker and it's going to cost a lot less. Um, so I think Georgia may be feeling the heat a little bit, and they're talking about paper, but I think they may be veering off a little bit in the uh, in a, a, a not optimal solution. Um, and uh, there are other states that are looking to try to get um, funding, but they don't have the funds. Uh, Pennsylvania, I know there's interest in Pennsylvania in some places to move to paper ballots. There's a lot of interest in New Jersey. They don't have the money, um, and that's where the federal government could really come in and help. Shane, did you want to offer something? Well, I wanted to add to that that she pointed out exactly. I mean, like in Minnesota, um, anybody here from the state of Minnesota, their local election <laughs> officials do other elections, in meaning like by city by city. They do not do it by county. In certain states, the state purchases all the election equipment for them. Um, and so like in Missouri, I as an election authority get to purchase the election equipment that I want to use for our county, but it has to be certified by the Secretary of State. And so it goes back to one of the things I really want to encourage, um, and I was uh, here on Capitol Hill in 96 and 97 um, in a position as a legislative assistant for then Congressman Roy Blunt had just been elected. I know the influence that each of you have in this room in terms of visiting with your members of Congress, um, whether they're in the House or Senate. One of the things I really want to encourage is set that standard, that measuring stick, but if you decide to offer funds with it, please be very careful in terms of the um, strings that are attached to that because one of the things that I can tell you election authorities across not only in our state but probably many states is that the HAVA audits became a nightmare for them in terms of trying to do all the things that they were required to show in terms of how the funding was spent. Yes, we want to be careful with how um, dollars and cents are spent. But there's a lot of election officials that frankly don't want any HAVA money because of the headache that was caused after they accepted the HAVA funds um, after the uh, HAVA bill passed in 2005. So I think there's a balance there, and I would really encourage that balance. Um, and think about that you've got some election authorities that have millions of dollars at their disposal. Other election authorities um, literally have no dollars at their disposal. And how you allow that money to be dispersed is important in terms of the election systems that are chosen. But um, for example, in our county, we want the balance. We want the paper ballot, but for the person who has a disability in terms of how they fill out the paper ballot, we want them to have the electronic machine, as is required by HAVA and ADA. But there's a lot of complexities that an election authority has to consider because of HAVA and because of ADA both. And so um, think carefully as you're looking at the Paper Act and some of the things that follow with that because there's a lot of unintended consequences that incur if you don't think through that. 
Well, and I would I would just add that that's that's a really great point that the diversity of our system really does make the details quite complicated. But I think if we um, make sure that legislation focuses on the key objectives of making sure we have physical evidence for every vote and making sure that evidence is audited to high standards. Um, those are objectives that every state should be able to meet, um, but the details of how they do um, are likely going to vary. A perfect closing remark, Alex. And what our election official from Virginia, do you need rebuttal time? <laughs> I just wasn't sure. Okay. All right, with that, I want to thank you all for being here today. And before you give a final thank you to our panelists, I want to give an especial thank you to several uh, members and individuals who made today possible. Uh, Senators Klobuchar, Meadows, and Langvin, uh, we thank them and their offices for working on the legislation, for working with the coalitions, and for helping us to find this room and, and provide the space for us today. I'd also like to thank our friends at NADC and Verified Voting, and a, and a special thank you to my colleagues at the Brennan Center um, who have just done amazing work, particularly my colleagues Lawrence Norton, who is an expert on these issues, Rudy Mirbani and Daniel Weiner, uh, and uh, Anthony Thomas Davis, who helped to put this together, and my colleague uh, Beatrice, uh, uh, Beatrice from our New York office who works on our communications team, um, and for all of you for being here today. And you stayed, even though probably the cookies are gone, uh, but we really thank you for being here today. Today. Please continue to talk about these issues. There's great work to be done. Please be on the lookout for the legislation. And please give a round of applause to our wonderful panel. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here.